So let's take a moment now to review the commands that can be used to enable RIPNG. And then we're going to go ahead and do it. First and foremost, you need IPv6 routing enabled. By default, it's not. So in global configuration mode, you issue the IPv6 unicast routing command to turn it on. If you fail to turn on IPv6 routing, when you enter the next command, IPv6 router RIP, to enable the RIP routing process on the device, it'll tell you. IPv6 unicast routing is not enabled. You must turn it on. So then you have to go back and turn it on. But let's say it is turned on. You then type in IPv6 router RIP, and then you specify a name for this RIP routing process. In this case, they called it RTO. But it doesn't matter what you do. It's up to you. Just make sure you document what you use. And it is locally significant. So this is the name for that RIP process. It's locally significant. None of the other routers care about what the name is on this particular router. But in the real world, I would do as they do here. And I would make sure that the routers are using the same name for the RIP routing process because it makes it easier on you as an administrator. All the routers in this area that are sharing routing information using RIPNG are going to use the same name. It just keeps things simple on you from an administrative standpoint and from a troubleshooting standpoint. Once your RIP process has been enabled on the device, you can then go to interface configuration mode and in interface configuration mode, enable the process on the interface itself. Just because it's enabled globally doesn't mean you're routing. You have to have the routing process enabled on an interface in order for routing to occur. So in this particular example, they went to interface Ethernet 0, they typed in IPv6 RIP, the name of the process. So here's the connection between these two right here. You have to get this right. If you accidentally enter an incorrect process name at the interface level, you know what happens? The router creates a new process based on that name. It does. So now you've got configs all over the place, when in actuality, it should have been part of the RTO RIP process. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Now down below, you can see that Ethernet 0, or pardon me, Ethernet 1, also had the RIP routing process enabled on its interface. Why? There's no router out Ethernet 1. Therefore, we're not going to have to share routing information with any router out that interface. But remember how a routing protocol works. You enable the routing process on an interface. And once you enable that routing process on an interface, the network the interface is part of gets injected into the routing process and therefore is advertised to other routers. So if I want this particular network right here to be advertised to other routers, I have to enable the RIP NG routing process on that interface as well. So not just the interfaces that are connecting routers together where we're going to share information, but also those other interfaces in our network that we want to have uh, the network's advertised for. So let's take a moment now and configure RIPNG in our environment. We've already enabled the RIPNG process on all of the routers except for R1, so our focus will be on configuring RIPNG on router R1. We will enable it on the GIG 2.0 interface as well as the GIG 1.0.1 interface. Let's go ahead and do that now. First and foremost, let's remember to enable in global configuration mode IPv6 unicast routing. Very, very important. Once that's enabled, we can then type in the IPv6 router rip command and then specify the name of the process we're creating. And in this example, I'm going to use route underscore rip. However, that doesn't matter. You can use whatever you want. I just chose this for this particular example, and it just happens to be the same on all of my routers in the topology. So I'm doing myself a favor in keeping things consistent in my network. 
Once you hit enter, you are in router rip configuration mode for rip ng. And we'll just take a quick look here at the different options you have in this configuration mode. And one of the big things you'll notice is that the network command is not there. If you recall back to your RIP v2 days or your EIGRP for IPv4 days or your OSPF v2 days, there was a network command. And that network command was responsible for enabling the routing process on an interface. Well, RIP ng does not have that. So we've omitted the network command. So as we saw earlier, we are going to enable the RIP ng process on an interface by interface basis now. So our first interface is interface gigabit 2 slash 0. And once we're in interface configuration mode, we're going to type in IPv6 RIP. And then it's looking for that process name. So what did we call it? Route underscore RIP. Route underscore RIP. And then it's asking you, do you want us to set default information? Do you want to enable it? Do a metric offset, summary address? We just want to enable it right now. So we'll type in enable, and we've just enabled it on the interface. And the next interface is interface gigabit 1 slash 0 dot 1. And we'll enter the same command in subinterface configuration mode this time. And we're done. We should have received information from R3 already. In regards to IPv6 routes, so let's take a look at that. Show IPv6 route, shows us our IPv6 routing table. And there we have it. There's all the IPv6 routes learned within our environment. If we take a close look here, we can see that the 2001 double colon A, or pardon me, 2001 colon A, colon A, colon 7, double colon slash 64 network, which is all the way connected to R7 is reachable out gigabit ethernet 2 slash 0 using the link local address of FE80 double colon 31. So as I mentioned, the next hop address is a link local address. And who owns FE80 double colon 31? It's actually R3. So if we jump over to R3 and we do a show IPv6 interface brief, we'll see here the FE80 double colon 31. Let's go back to R1. Does that match up? FE80 double colon 31. Yes, it does. So that is the link local address of R3, the next hop address in this case. If we look in brackets, we still have the same administrative distance of 120. And there's our metric, the number of router hops we need to use in order to get to that particular destination network.